Julia. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our virtual field trip for this year. We are trying something new, so please be patient um, with the virtual field trip as far as typing in the chat on Google Classroom. Um, please make sure that if you do have questions that you ask them um, appropriately. Do not spam the chat this year. So if you ask questions multiple times, there is a chance that you will get removed from the Google Classroom. Sorry. And uh, make sure that you are patient with the technology. ERM is very uh, gracious enough to be in the field and sometimes we have technology lag or the uh, camera will overheat or not be able to uh, work and they will get back on. Um, we hope that you have fun and as soon as we get towards the end of the field trip, you guys can go ahead and check the uh, Google Classroom for the Google Form and the Google Form will be live for your attendance. We thank you guys for attending and hope that you have fun and ask as many questions as you possibly can. All right, Benji, go ahead and take it away. Benji. All right. Good morning, everybody. I'm Benji Stute with Palm Beach County's Environmental Resources Management. Uh, so we're out here at Delaware Scrub Natural Area today up in Jupiter. Um, I am so excited for this morning. We've got a, a jam-packed field trip here for the next hour. Uh, and the reason why, you know, we, we usually try to take you to these really wild places. Um, and the reason why we came to Delaware Scrub is because even though it's only 16 acres and it's surrounded by development, uh, this place is so diverse, it's so unique, uh, and it's so wild if you know what to look for. Um, so we're gonna get into all that, but uh, I know our time is short. So I wanna start by introducing Taylor. So Taylor here is with Bush Wildlife Sanctuary. Uh, Bush is amazing partners of ours. Uh, we work with them a ton. They're one of our natural area adopters. They release a lot of their rehabilitated animals. So Taylor has joined us with some educational animals so we can get you guys up close to some of the characters that call Delaware Scrub home. Uh, but Taylor, Bush Wildlife Sanctuary is, is such an important part of our community. So what do you guys do? Like, what is your mission? So our mission is to first rescue animals. We get around 6,000 animals every year. Florida native wildlife, so no cheetahs, jaguars, but animals you find in your own backyard, like our hawk here. Our then goal is to rehabilitate those animals to the best we can to where they are healthy enough to be released. We also have a goal in mind to help educate the public about our animals as we sometimes get animals we cannot release and those become permanent residents. Right, so you guys have an amazing sanctuary. Um, if you guys have not visited Bush Wildlife Sanctuary, uh, please go. They're getting ready for a big move out to Jupiter Farms, but they're still right there in the middle of Jupiter. Um, black bears, panthers, bobcats, all of these amazing raptors and other birds. So uh, if you're into Florida wildlife, please go visit Bush. Um, I'm having a little bird ADD here because we have got migration going on kind of in full swing right now, uh, which is really special. We're gonna talk about that a little later, but don't mind me if I just start looking up at the birds and the trees. So right here, Taylor, what do we have? So this is Rivali. Rivali is our red shoulder hawk. Now he is with us because he came in when he was just a little guy, probably only a few months old, maybe about six months. And he had three different wing breaks. We're not 100% sure how it happened as a person just found him on the ground, brought him to us. Chances are he either fell out of his nest or ran into something. Uh, but because of that, the one had already grown back incorrectly. So we had to deem him a permanent resident because you can't re-break it and try to fix it. Yeah. So he's been here ever since. He has partial flight, so he can get a few feet up, few feet out. He just can't soar properly to be able to be released back into the wild. And he's currently about two years old. He actually just got in all his adult coloration this past summer. That's amazing. I mean, he is a beauty. So you guys can see why they call this bird a red-shouldered hawk, because right there on the shoulder, you see that beautiful red color. And so Taylor was saying this bird just got its adult feathers in. And Sam, if we come around to the front here, you can see that black and white checkered pattern on the back and this beautiful buffy breast here, this kind of rusty color. Uh, so it takes about two years for that to come in. And before that, they're kind of mottled brown and white, It'd be a little more camouflage when they're juveniles. Um, these birds are really cool. They are real generalists. They're birds of the forest. So they occur all throughout the eastern U.S. and um, they uh, they rely on forest habitats, but forest habitats with an open sub canopy. And so that's why we're kind of standing right here, because Sam, if you can pan over real quick uh, this way so you can see 
we're kind of here in this open area in this scrubby flatwoods habitat. And this is the perfect habitat for a bird like a red-shouldered hawk. So let's come back over. Now this bird is in the Buteo family. Um, and so Buteos are, are a type of hawk or raptor uh, that, are, that are really identified by these broad wings and these broad tails. This is a medium-sized raptor, um, but those kind of morphological features, the broad wings and the broad tail, it allows them to swoop down from a perch, which is how they, how they generally hunt. Uh, and they're taking prey from the ground. And so when they're diving down to get that prey, they got to stop really quick. And that's kind of a feature of these birds. Uh, there are other raptors we have here, like the Cooper's hawk, which has a, a lot more raked and streamlined wing shape and a much more squared off and long tail. And those animals take birds and they take birds on the wing. So they're like fighter jets in the forest. But this guy right here, um, they're going to sit up on a perch with an open area, just like this in Delaware scrub, and they're going to look for animals like small rodents, rats, mice. Uh, here in Florida, they also take a lot of snakes and uh, tree frogs uh, and lizards. Um, and so this bird is really built to be a generalist and to take a lot of variety of prey. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why they do really well, even in the urban suburban habitats. I mean, these birds will be in city parks. Um, and, you know, they'll be in environments like this where we have pockets of forest in an urban environment. Um, so really, really cool. I don't know, Taylor, if I'm missing anything. I mean, yeah, <laughs> they're really cool birds. <laughs> so you can see those amazing eyes. Raptors, all raptors have this amazing eyesight. We're going to meet another raptor later with even better eyesight than this red-shouldered hawk. But you can kind of see those pupils dilating, going in and out. Um, these birds are just incredible, incredible predators. Our population here in South Florida is getting ready to increase because these birds are migratory. So some of the birds from the far northern breeding areas up in the northern U.S. and Canada will be coming south um, and into different parts of the U.S. and in Florida over the winter. Um, if you have one of these birds in your park or in your yard and you see it year after year, it's likely the same bird. These birds will pair up and they will nest uh, in the same or similar places uh, for years on end. Um, do you know how long these birds live? Usually medium-sized birds in captivity is usually um, into their 20s. Uh, is what we say in the wild is usually about half that give or take. So. Okay. Awesome. Uh, Taylor, uh, we're going to say bye for now, but mm -hmm. we're going to meet you down by the swamp yeah. with uh, another special treat. All right? all right. Thank you. All right. So next I want to introduce you all to our site manager here. Her name is Tori. And Tori's going to talk to us about why Delaware Scrub is so unique and so special. And Sam, I'm trying to trip you on these vines. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, Benji, what is the job of a site manager? What's that? What is the job of a site manager? Oh, what, that's about everything, right? <laughs> so our site managers, uh, they're in the environmental analyst class series. Uh, so Tori is out here. So she, she does not only manage Delaware Scrub. How many sites do you have? Five. So five different sites. And so she's visiting those sites on at least a weekly basis, yeah. um, putting her eyes on the site and looking for things like exotic vegetation, um, different things uh, on the perimeter. If, if there's fences that need to be repaired, she's monitoring that kind of stuff, making sure the public use facilities are in shape. But really the bulk of her job is managing this habitat. And we're gonna talk a lot about what goes into that management today. Um, so she's the one planning for these different treatments uh, and, and things like that that go into keeping these natural areas uh, and these natural habitats the way they're supposed to be, right? So let's kind of talk about that right now, because right here, so what do we have this plant here? This is a large flower rosemary. It's a Conradina multiflora, and it's a really rare scrub plant that's actually threatened um, it's endemic to this region of Florida, so it's not found anywhere else in the world. Right. So that's really that's really cool. So when we say endemic, that means it's very special to just here in South or in the eastern portion of the Florida Peninsula. Yeah. So it occurs on this coastal scrub and scrubby flatwoods, and that's what we're in right now, right? Yep. Um, and so one of the reasons why this plant is threatened and rare because of fire suppression right and development yeah because it it it, it, it actually does best when it herb, they will some be sort of disturbance. say that again 
Oh, okay. We lost uh, you for a moment, but now you're back. So we're okay. Okay. So, so right. So this plant needs disturbance, yes. which a lot of the scrub plants need, right? Yeah. So in the scrub, yeah, you guys are out. You know, it looks like you guys are very low on Wi-Fi with one one little bar. So that might be an issue with our yeah. connectivity. So, mm. Hang on, hang on, real quick. Okay. I'm sorry. This is one of the issues that we were talking about. So just be patient while we make our adjustments in the field. All right. So I just uh, we have Wi-Fi on, so I just clicked it off. We should have decent cell service. Perfect. Sounds good. Okay, we're back. How about now, Heather? We are good to go. Okay. okay. All right. Okay, great. So we're talking about the, the large flower false rosemary and how it likes disturbance. So the scrub habitat is very different than say our flatwoods that are five miles west. Those habitats, they want to burn every couple of years, yeah. right? Every like two to five years would be like a flatwood. Right. But this in this scrubby flatwoods, so this is this is really cool. We'll talk about this habitat a little more. Um, but what's the interval on this habitat? Scrub, yes, yeah, scrubby flatwoods would be like eight to fifteen years. Right, and yeah. a lot more intense fire. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're not going to get the fire rolling through the landscape as continuously as you would in pine flatwoods because there's it's not broken up as much. But in the scrub, you have lots of large areas of open sand where the fire won't carry as much. So when you have a scrub fire, it's usually really severe, really big, and almost wipes out the entire habitat. Well, and then regenerates, regenerates it, right? And yeah. so what we call these fires are stand replacing fires. So scrub fires will even consume things like the sand pine yeah. trees, right? Yeah. But that's really important for native species like the scrub jay. Now we don't have scrub jays here, but they're a little bit north of us. Scrub jays rely on those snag trees, those dead pines, mm -hmm. uh, because they send out sentinel birds to kind of watch and, and look for things. Um, but that fire, the stand replacing fire, takes all of that nutrient and all that ash and puts it into this really, really sandy soil, which gives us kind of a boost, an energy boost yeah. that a lot of these native plants rely on. Yeah. And it also opens up the cover. And so here now we're in the middle of suburbia. It's going to be really difficult if we can ever put fire on the ground here, yeah. right? We've and so a lot of smoke sensitive areas surrounding us. Right. We've got schools and hospitals and things like that. So what are you doing here management wise? What have you planned to try to recreate that disturbance of fire without actually setting the landscape on fire? So we're doing um, mechanical vegetation reduction and we do that with large pieces of equipment and they come in here and shred up the understory and take down some of the sand pines to recreate what a fire would do if it was rolling through the landscape. And so we open up the, the understory, create more open patches, and um, we do it in a, um, in a sequence manner where we just do like one unit at a time. So we're not chopping the entire unit at one time. Um, the One of the main costs of doing mechanical vegetation reduction is that it leaves a bunch of debris on the ground. So I'm actually help. I'm working with our volunteer coordinator and we are removing some of that mulch from the ground so that we have that open aspect to the, to the ground cover so that herbaceous vegetation can actually grow through that and get the sunlight. Yeah. So really a, a kind of a multi-pronged approach to management here. Uh, we've got to work really hard and come up with these different techniques. If there's an area here that needs that disturbance that fire would create, um, but we can't really implement that fire in this setting. Uh, the other thing that's really important about this management is it does the other thing that fires do for us, which is it protects the neighborhood around here, right? If we don't let fire in here or we don't manage the habitat, all this fuel builds up and then if we have a wildfire, then that can be catastrophic. Um, and so this management is also knocking down the fuels. Um, like Tori said, on, on her site, she's even getting volunteers to bring some of that mulch out, get the fuel out of here. Um, and so then if we do have a wildfire, it should be much more manageable uh, to contain and put out. Yeah. Um, all right, so Tori, last uh, with you is, we touched on a little bit why Delaware scrub is special, 16 acres. Mm -hmm. 
But how many different habitats do we have here? Like, we have, it's amazing. Yeah, we have five actually. So it starts out with scrubby flatwoods, mesic flatwoods, rolls into um, a dome swamp, cypress dome swamp, back out into mesic flatwoods, then to scrubby flatwoods, to scrub, and then tidal swamp. Right, right. And so we actually have mangrove swamp here as well. The, the trail, it's very short, but you will travel through all these habitats if you visit Delaware Scrub in about 20 minutes. <laughs> it's amazing. You know, you can, you can see all these different plants that are involved with all these different, you know, um, environmental factors. And then you end down on Jones Creek, which is a tributary to the Loctatchee River. Wild and scenic. How many habitats are normally in, in natural area ecosystem area? What's up? How many um, habitats are normally in a natural area ecosystem? I mean, so like we could talk about, you know, like our Pine Glades natural area, it's our second largest 6,500 acres. And there's not many more than that over that many mm -hmm. thousands of acres because that is a much more continuous, it's this um, mesic and wet flatwoods interspersed with wet prairies and, and freshwater marshes. Um, it has a few dome swamps in it, um, but that's that's really it for Pine Glades. And it's 6,600 acres, and you got five or six habitats. And then right here in Delaware Scrub, you've got the same, <laughs> the same diversity. So it's a really cool example, and it's very accessible. What's that? Is it all about water? So here, um, yeah. so Alicia's kind of asking yeah. us, is it about water? And yeah, I mean, water is everything in Florida, and so is elevation, right? And so that's... One of the reasons why Delaware Scrub has this diversity is because when we're next to these tributaries, these creek systems that feed the river, that's when we actually get a little elevation change in Florida. Out in Pine Glades, it is all flat. You know, the, the landscape generally drops about a foot per mile as you go from west to east, draining towards the river. But here, we've got the channelized tributary and then the mangrove swamp, and then it comes right up into yeah. scrub and scrubby flatwoods and then back down into that dome swamp. So it's all about uh, elevation. Mm -hmm. That elevation is gonna change the soil characteristics. And of course, water is what feeds the whole system. Yeah. And okay. Even, even so, just a few inches of difference in gradient can change the entire habitat composition. Yeah. All right, so Tori, we're gonna say bye to you. We're gonna pick you back up at the swamp. Okay. But we're gonna go check in with uh, Kylie uh, and we'll talk about keystone species and she's got another special guest for us. So Sam, come on in this way. Benji, can you explain what a keystone species is for those that are tuning in now? All right, so a keystone species, you're gonna learn in just a second. All right, Sam, so watch the vines here. We got some vines growing back. <laughs> all about it <laughs> Hi, guys. oh man okay all right everybody this is kylie so uh i'm really stoked to introduce kylie she's our newest team member at erm if you've been watching our field trips um you know that kylie is a new face but you will see her a lot more um so kylie first of all uh what are you holding so everybody this is an eastern indigo snake this is another one of our friends from bush wildlife sanctuary her name is coco and you can tell that she's quite a large snake Believe it or not, she's only about three years old and she came to Bush as a young snake um, due to a herniated umbilical cord. Now, this is one of the largest native species of snake here in the state of Florida. They can get up to eight feet long. She's not there yet, but she's getting some good growth on her over these years. Now they get their name, I don't know if we can see in the light here if the sun comes through enough, because you might say, hey, they look black. But really, um, they get this purpley rainbow indigo sheen um, in the sunlight, which is why they get the name the indigo snake. Now, these guys are super important. Um, they are a threatened species here in Florida, but they're really far migrators. So they use habitats here like the scrub and mesic flatwood um, all around Florida, um, traveling long distances as opportunistic hunters, which is really cool. All right. So, um, so Kylie, now these guys are a commensal yeah. to what we're standing right next to. Do you want me to take Coco real quick? Yeah, let's have you take Coco and we can focus on some commensal. All right. So, so really, quick, this... really quickly, we have a lot of people saying that she's really beautiful. 
Um, so we all agree. We can definitely see that little sheen that she has. Now, if I'm not mistaken, Coco joined us last year or the year before when we were out of Delaware Scrub. How much yes. has she grown since then? Because we we definitely noticed that she's a lot more massive. Yeah, yeah. So she's she's probably got another foot on her since uh, about about a year. I think that was I think that was about a year ago. Um, so she's definitely grown in length, but she's really getting a little bit of this heft, you know. <laughs> Just getting and, wider, some girth to her. <laughs> yeah. Now this is an educational snake, but a really cool thing about indigos is, you know, a wild one is pretty much going to be this mellow too. They're super mellow snakes. Um, they just want to hang out, chill out. They're kind of very secure in their spot in the environment, right? These are kind of the kings of the flatwoods and, oh, yeah. and you know, these pinelands. Um, so tell us a little bit before we see the gopher tours about like what kind of animals this thing preys so on. So as you can imagine, it's one of the largest native snakes that we have here. They're going to take advantage of that. So there's something known as opportunistic hunters. They're not those constrictors that you really think of as snakes. Um, but what they're gonna do is they're gonna find anything that they can fit in their mouth that's smaller than them. So they're gonna hunt small birds, eggs, reptiles, um, which means that they actually are capable of eating rattlesnakes. So they're one of the few species that we have in the state of Florida that can eat venomous snakes, which is pretty cool. They're also known to eat small alligators. So oh, pretty man. special snake for being such a docile animal, truly. Yeah, and it's a little cool out this morning, even though I'm sweating. And so Coco is, is very chilled out mm -hmm. because uh, this is a cold-blooded animal. Yep, so, so. cold-blooded ectotherm which means that they're getting that uh, heat or coolness from their environment. So they got to work with the sun and shade, which brings us to a great resource that they have, which makes them a commensal with something known as our local species, the gopher tortoise. So if you guys check this out down here. We have a quick question here. real quick, sorry, about yeah. Coco. They want to know why the indigo is threatened. Oh, so that's a great question. So the indigo, just like our friend that we're going to talk about here in a second, is threatened mostly due to something known as habitat degradation or fragmentation. So as I said, these guys are migrators. They're going to move through multiple of Florida's habitats, um, searching for food, as well as partners to meet with and different things like that. With that being said, when we have development, um, like all around us here in Delaware Square, uh, Delaware scrub, excuse me, we're going to have problems with um, them being able to find corridors from these uh, ecosystems that attach to travel um, and to migrate. So that's one of the biggest problems um, is development with habitat fragmentation for these guys. Yeah. yeah. And so we were talking about these guys are cold blooded and they rely on somebody else to thermoregulate, right? Yeah. So as you can see here, we have what's called a gopher tortoise burrow. Now you guys might have seen these through various areas in Florida, um, native habitats that include sandy scrub pine um, and our dunes. You might even see one in your backyard or in the field area of your school. Um, you can tell that this gopher tortoise burrow is a pretty active burrow. Um, if Sam's getting some good shots, you might be able to see some of the activity that's in the sand here, some uh, footprints of those gopher tortoises. Now the gopher tortoise, and it's the reason that this burrow that you see here is considered a keystone species. Now a keystone species like the gopher tortoise is a species that within that ecosystem, if that species did not exist, you would see a dramatic change in other species within that ecosystem or a decline of the ecosystem overall. Now the reason for that is, is that this burrow that these gopher tortoises dig, now this is just a shell, the carapace is another word for this shell. Um, what they do is 350 other native species, and even some that aren't native, even some invasives, are found to utilize this gopher tortoise burrow for multiple different versions of in their life. So what this indigo snake, Coco here, she's actually called a priority commensal. So that means that the relationship between the gopher tortoise and this indigo snake is a priority for her. She actually depends greatly on gopher tortoise burrows for her survival. One of those big reasons Benji was saying is because they are cold blooded. So she's out in the sun and the heat and she needs to find a cool place. You know, those August days when Florida is just really, really hot. She seeks out these gopher tortoise burrows and is going to hide out in there and be able to cool down. Right, it's like nature's air conditioning. Right? Exactly, a nice dark hole, you know. Snakes like them, 
small lizards, frogs, other rodents, they can't dig these giant burrows. Some of these can be 40 feet down as the highest I think they've seen in most of Florida. Yeah. But they're going to have the ability to hide out in there. They, when she's down there, can also find various food sources that she can eat. So it's super critical that they have these gopher tortoise burrows. Right, so where you have gopher tortoises, there's, there's a, like this labyrinth of tunnels underground. One tortoise can dig multiple burrows, so it doesn't live in just one. Um, again, that's a great benefit to animals like Coco. Um, there's another couple of uh, endangered and, and endemic Florida species, the gopher frog. So the gopher frog is an amphibian that uh, almost exclusively lives with... I love like my trees. <laughs> Making an escape. <laughs> we got to get away from... Uh, can we take it back? All right. Um, so the gopher frogs almost exclusively live with gopher tortoises in their burrows. One of the best times to see these cool little frogs is after a rain, uh, they will come up out of the burrow and kind of look for a little bit of moisture to drink. And so oftentimes you might catch a glimpse of them after a heavy rain uh, out on this apron. This apron is, is what we call the sandy area around the burrow. And this apron is really important too. This is where the gopher tortoises lay their eggs, right? Um, what happens when it floods? What happens when it floods? Ah, so gopher tortoises have, again, they dig multiple burrows. We have seen burrows in like our Loxatchee Slough natural area, and they're actually at different elevations. Some are up on the canal bank for when water's really high, and then there's other ones that get down into the hammock for when water is really low. So gopher tortoises do rely on you know, drier habitats. So they're living in more of the upland areas, the upland sandy soil areas, the scrub habitats, the scrubby flatwoods. This is why Delaware scrub is perfect for these animals. Um, and when Kylie said, you know, 40 feet, that's not 40 feet down. It's 40 feet long, and they can be up to about eight feet down in the soil, but that all depends, right, on where their burrow is in relation to the water table. Yeah, so great, great question. Um, let's see, we got anything else about gopher tortoises? We got some really cool stuff to show you down at the swamp. So I think we're gonna say bye to Kylie unless there's any questions. Um, no and more. We're head down to the swamp but before we get. Oh, sorry. Before we get there, we're gonna meet another friend from Bush Wildlife Sanctuary. So Kylie, uh, we will see you later down at the All swamp. Right. Okay. Thanks, guys. Have fun. Thank you. So well, let's see if we can get down there without tripping all over ourselves. Actually, I think we can go this way, Sam. Yeah. All right, Sam, I'm going to try to take you with the minimal amount of trip hazard. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> looking around the ground here because this is one of these areas that where we can't really implement uh, prescribed fire because it's surrounded by so many smoke sensitive areas and by development when you have these beautiful pine trees they drop all of this all these needles and they create what we call duff and I'm really looking at this duff because I'm looking and see if we can find a wild snake uh, so a lot of our native species like our red rat snakes our corn snakes I almost guarantee you that I have walked over one already today, but you almost won't see them because they will be moving underneath all of this duff layer. They'll go in there and they'll just be going right underneath it. Uh, another one is a coral snake. Uh, it's one of our venomous snakes in Florida. Uh, they almost never bite people unless you're messing with them. They're not like rattlesnakes, which have the front fangs. Um, uh, rattlesnakes are called pit vipers. Um, the coral snake actually has rear fixed fangs, so they really kind of get, got to get on you and chew on you to do anything. Um, really, really cool snakes, and they rely on areas like this with duff uh, to, uh, to survive. And so as we're walking here, I'm just looking and seeing if there's anything that we can find on our way. So if we can't use any controlled burns in there, 
do you guys manually go in or do you just let nature take its course? So not, not here, um, you know, where we do the mechanical removal that Tori was talking about, uh, you know, we, we do have volunteers come in and remove all of that mulch material, but where, where you have this stuff coming down from, um, uh, from the pines, um, no, we won't come in and mechanically remove it. You know, that's going to do a little too much damage to the other plants around it. Uh, these big slash pines are kind of notoriously fickle about having machinery run over their root systems. And especially when there's been this much duff that is built up already, um, a lot of these trees will have feeder roots that are coming up into the duff. So if you start to remove it, you're really going to impact these big, beautiful trees here. So it's, you know, when we get these fragmented natural areas, that's kind of part of the land manager's job is to try to figure out how to deal with managing these habitats and, and keeping them in the most native state that they can when oftentimes there's these compromises that we have to make. There's a family of blue jays up, up ahead of us calling. And then there's another cool plant right here. This is we're passing by. Uh, so this is a, a listed plant. I think, I believe this is threatened. Um, and this is called a cinnamon fern. And you can see why it's called a cinnamon fern because it's inflorescence here, these spores. Uh, really look like a stick of cinnamon and they've got that beautiful color on them. And so we biologists know that we're seeing this cinnamon fern and that means we're going down in elevation and we're getting close to the swamp. As we see this vegetation change, um, we know that we're getting lower and lower. And so we should be hitting water pretty soon. Sam. Come on through. Hey Taylor. All right, so Taylor is back with a super, super rad animal. This is one of my favorites. This is an Eastern Screech Owl. Um, one of our smallest owls in North America. Like the cutest, cutest animal. So Taylor, can you tell us a little bit about this bird and how he came to Bush and, and kind of what his story is? So this is Chewy. Um, didn't originally get the name for being a chewer, but he kind of earned it. He likes to chew on the glove. Um, but he is with us. Um, I don't know if you guys can tell, but he's actually looks like he's missing an eye. However, it is technically still there. He was found as a baby. Someone brought him in as a little orphan. As he got older, we realized that the eye was basically like a shriveled up raisin in there. As he's gotten older, it's kind of gotten smaller and shrunken a little bit more. So he has basically no eyesight at all out of that. Um, and that is why we have to keep him at the sanctuary. Um, and as Benji said, he is an adult. Um, he's currently about three or four years old, but birds of prey grow up so fast, but by the time they're six months to a year, they have usually almost all their adult colors and they're uh, full grown. And so this is a full grown owl, believe it or not. Uh, and this is the gray phase. Now we have another phase too, right? Yeah. So there's also a red one. Uh, we actually have another one at the sanctuary that is the red morph. And they're really, really pretty. They're my favorite color of them. All right. And so now Taylor, our red shouldered hawk, you know, we're not really sure if that's a male or female because there's not a whole lot of size difference. But we know this is a male, right? Yes. And that is because as far as the screech owls go, um, he's much smaller than a lot of our other screech owls. We haven't had a female in fact the past and she was basically two times bigger than he was. So. Right, right. And you will find that in a lot of raptor species where the females will be larger than the males. Um, the screech owl is is one of those examples. These are awesome, awesome birds. Uh, obviously, it's getting a little late towards sleepy time for him. The sun is up, right? Um, so these guys are mostly active at night. Like all of our owls, uh, they have eyes that are fixed in their socket. So you will not see that eye move like you did the hawk where the hawk can move its eyes. Owls have fixed eyes and that means they have to turn their head to see over here and over there. Um, that also means that they have evolved to be able to turn their heads almost 270 degrees, almost three quarters of the way around. Like if I'm standing here and I'm looking here, I could turn my head this way and look at Taylor. Um, and so another really cool adaptation, like other owls, their feathers are adapted to fly silently so they can be really efficient hunters at night. Uh, these birds do wonderful uh, anywhere that, where there is forest. They need trees 
because of where they nest, right? So they're cavity nesters and they don't uh, dig out their own cavities in trees. So they rely on things like woodpeckers or, you know, after a fire that we talked about, you get some dead trees that are called snags that start to rot and they'll nest in those places. Um, these are a great bird if you want to get into birding because they readily accept nest boxes, right? So you can put up a nest box in your yard uh, and you can attract these birds uh, to your yard and have them nest in your yard. Uh, one other thing, so we were talking about the difference with males and females. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, every bird has a different strategy of how to reproduce. And for screech owls, the female really tends to the eggs and to the young. She makes forays out a little bit during dawn and dusk, but she's not really hunting. So when the female is sitting on the eggs and rearing the chicks, the male is doing the vast majority of the hunting and actually his smaller size makes him more maneuverable, more agile, and makes him a little more efficient hunter, which really uh, does well uh, for when they're reproducing and when they have those babies in the nest. Hey, buddy. Then now, question, yep. are you reach out aggressive at all? Are they what? Aggressive at all. Are they aggressive? No, no. Um, <laughs> these guys are gonna wanna definitely get out of your way. Um, they will They will kind of defend territory. So the males will defend territory, especially when uh, they're, they're nesting. Um, these birds are, again, generalists, kind of like, um, kind of like the red-shouldered hawk, where they're going to take a, a really wide variety of prey. Uh, they'll take birds sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, they will also take, you know, small rodents at night. Um, they'll take lizards and frogs. Uh, you can, like other owls, they will um, regurgitate pellets, uh, which will contain bones and things that, that will tell you about what they're eating. But um, up until they were studied further, what we realized we were missing is things that don't show up in the pellets because they digest really well. So these birds also eat a ton of insects and earthworms and even things like crayfish. Uh, they're actually really good at taking prey out of really shallow water. So like a uh, stream bank or the edge of a pond where there's a nice little perch or a tree, they can sit eight or 10 feet up um, and they can look for all this prey. So if you got these birds around your house, um, it's a wonderful sign. They're doing you a favor. They're taking care of those rodents uh, and those pesky insects. Um, I don't know. What did, did I miss anything about our cool little I mean, we could out? talk about his little plumicorns, yeah, those funny sure. little things. So everybody always asks, they're always like, are those his ears? Are those his horns? Because a lot of times, you know, in the great horned owl, people assume because they're called that, that they're horns. Um, but they're actually just literally tufts of feathers. Um, scientists currently believe they're used to show emotion. So in a way, kind of like our eyebrows. But in this one in particular, they believe it's used to help him camouflage. Being such a small bird of prey, he obviously has a lot of bigger birds of prey going after him. So by having those, moving them back and forth, they really help him blend in. And they do have ears, but they're actually little holes and they're kind of hidden behind their feathers. So you would have to physically pull back their feathers to be able to see those ear holes, which they do have excellent hearing as well. Yeah, amazing hearing. All owls have this amazing hearing. Uh, barn owls have even been documented to be able to, they have been done experiments where they will place barn owls, different species, in a completely dark room, zero light, and they're able to hunt just by hearing. So owls, all owls will also have this facial disc. So they kind of have this flattened face and the feathers will come out. And that is another adaptation that helps funnel sound uh, to their ears to give them kind of supercharged uh, hearing. So I love owls because they're kind of the superheroes of the bird world. They've got all these kind of amazing traits from their eyesight to their amazing hearing to their silent flight. Um, and that's why they range so far. Uh, these birds go all the way to the, to the slope of the Rocky Mountains and cover every habitat east of there that has a tree. Um, so really, really cool birds and definitely one that you can find here on Delaware Scrub, but you will almost never see it uh, because of that amazing camouflage. They will sit and roost all day long. Uh, the best way to figure out if you have these birds in your neighborhood is actually to go out at dawn and dusk and a little bit into the night and listen for their really cool sound that they make. They make this kind of trill sound. You want to try? No. Yeah. It's kind of... <laughs> a little bit like that and uh, he's like no nah, i'm not impressed he sometimes <laughs> makes it he, he gets mad sometimes but i think he's happy being out here yeah so. he's enjoying all the trees right 
Um, so that's one of the best ways to know if you have screech owls in your areas to listen for them at night. Um, look up, kind of Google their sound, uh, and then go out at night and see if you can hear it. Um, it's such a cool treat to be able to see it. So if students go uh, out to bush wildlife, are they able to see the ambassador animals? Are they in um, enclosures that students would be able to see, or are they kept behind the scenes? So she's asking about the ambassador animals at Bush. Like, are they able to see them in enclosures or the programs that happen? So it depends. So most of our education ambassadors, those ones are behind the scenes. So the ones that are out all the time are going to be like your bobcats, your snakes, certain ones. But then our education ambassadors, to kind of give them a break and also make it a little bit more accessible for us to grab them, they're usually behind the scenes. Although we do have public programs every day of the week that we're open where we switch out which ones we bring out to be able to show you guys and teach you about each different one. Right, and, and the educational animals are selected, you know, because something has happened, but also because of temperament, exactly. right? Yep. So a lot of the animals that are on display, you know, they're they're in there for one reason or another, they're injured, um, but they may not be uh, uh, as, as friendly uh, to be educational animals, right? All right, so Taylor, we are gonna go dive in the swamp, um, okay. but thank you so much for joining us. You guys, please, uh, big thank you to Taylor. Again, if you have not checked out Bush Wildlife, please go visit them, go learn about our native wildlife. It is, it is so amazing where we live. Uh, and they're such a great ambassador of, of all the animals that we love. Um, so Taylor, thank you. We're going to head down to the swamp. I'm going to leave my camera yeah, here. So really that I don't throw it in the mud. Your current location the, the new one. What's that? Say that again, Heather. How long are they at their current location before moving to the new one? Do they know when your new uh, facility? goal is March or April of 2023 to be at the new location? Yep. So, yeah. So we've got about, we got about six or eight months, uh, at the current location and then hopefully They'll be making the move to the farms. All right, thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right. So. All right, so you guys that have been with us before, you know I love the swamp. What better way to start the morning than going and diving in the swamp? And we have one here at Delaware Scrub. So I'm going to reintroduce you to Kylie and Tori. They're going to come in the swamp with me. Um, anybody that's new, we do this thing where we set minnow traps. And that gives us a good idea of what's living under the water in these swamps. We have a trap right here. Kylie, oh, I am, I am really, I've got my fingers crossed because sometimes we catch these really amazing animals that almost no one in Florida even knows exist. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know. I grew up here and I've learned recently over the last few years. So, and this is so what we're looking for is one of our giant salamanders. Mm -hmm. So we've got kind of two species. There's the two toed Ampiuma and the greater siren. Um, and that's always kind of what we're looking for. Um, I think we've got a good chance because this particular swamp has some muck in it. Mm -hmm. And so these animals, really move through that mucky soil and that's where they hunt so anyways let's see what we got fingers crossed you guys All right, come on in So we're kind of moving into the into the uh, this basin marsh or cypress dome. There's some cypress over here, uh, this way, and then out here we've got all this beautiful button bush. Um, we've got really mucky soils here, which is again this is this great habitat. We're finally getting some water in here because this area was dry, right, Tori? Yeah, just just a month ago it was almost dry, except for some of the deep depressions that held water. The rest of it was just muddy. Right. right. <laughs> How high does the water get in that swamp area? How high does the water get? Um, it can get to be up to like waist deep. Um, yeah, hip, hip deep. Yeah. So right here we can actually we can actually look, uh, and we can see here we can see stain lines on the tree and lichen lines. The lichens are these lighter spots that come down the trunk, but you notice that they stop right about here. Over here you can see it more dramatically this right there and so we know that water will come up to this point in the swamp so it can come up about another foot 
we've had a really, really dry year this wet season. Um, and so, like Tori said, we actually just got water in the swamp here. And we can tell that because we know uh, that lichens cannot survive inundation for more than a couple of days at a time. Um, and so lichens are this symbiotic relationship between an algae uh, and a fungus. Right, right. And so the algae kind of provides the food. Uh, they photosynthesize and the fungus provides the structure that kind of build the house. Um, but we know they can't survive inundation. So that also tells us, even if we didn't know, well, how high can the water get? The plants can tell us. So let's see what our minnow traps here can tell us. So we baited these last night. And uh, what we do is we're really careful here to leave a little bit of air in case we get uh, an animal in here that breathes air, like uh, one of our water snakes. Yes! Yay. But we don't have a water snake today. We have one of our giant salamanders. The biggest in cool. North America and one of the biggest in the world. So this is, uh, and Tori said that because she could see that this is a two-toed amphiuma. This is not one of our sirens. The sirens are similar, they're an amphibian, um, but the sirens are, are a little bit smaller. They don't get quite as large. So this amphiuma, um, you know, these things can get what? Three, three feet, three, three and a half feet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is an amphibian um, and it's called a two-toed amphiuma because it has these little vestigial legs and I'm going to try to show those to you. <laughs> so we're going to try to get him out here. This guy has really poor eyesight. Ben, um, these are the ones that are featured in Hidden Wild, correct? Yes, yes. You can kind of see these vestigial legs yeah, at the yeah. back, Sam. See, there's... Oh, yeah, yeah see the little, little, little <laughs> tiny... So vestigial means that um, these animals have evolved. Those appendages used to be a lot bigger, but they pretty much don't use them. They move around in that muck soil and they use these sensory pits on the front of their face and they're seeking out uh, prey items that they can eat um, here in the swamp. And we're gonna talk about some of those in just a minute. Um, I'm gonna see if we can get this animal into my hands. It's really <laughs> difficult because these animals are around. supremely, supremely slimy. I'm gonna try to, and I'm being gentle with this guy because it is an, amphi uh, an amphibian. Oh, I'm feeling something in his gut. Wow. But, um, yeah, thank you, Sam. But these nice. guys do have kind of nasty teeth. <laughs> and so they can give you a bite. So I want to be real respectful of this guy. But you, you can see, leg. right. He's, he's, they pivot mostly with the ooh. leg. Okay. So I wanted to let him go. He was trying to find his way between my fingers and see him trying to find little gaps. Mm -hmm. He's trying to burrow. That's right. what he's trying to do. So Kylie, if you could hold this again, the trap for me. So you guys said that there was no water out there a couple weeks ago. So what happens to the two-toed amphiuma when there's no water, Benji? Right, so this is one of the very cool things about this animal. It is so slimy. When the swamp dries out, it can actually do this thing called estivation. Whoop, it's backing up. <laughs> so slimy, his tail's sitting right there. <laughs> All right, so lucky for you guys, we set some more traps and we have another one. All right, so Kylie, let's come let's over, here. over here. Uh, so Heather, you were asking about what happens when the swamp dries out. Yes, they're out. These up. animals actually create their own slime cocoon and they can do this thing called estivation. And they can do it for up to years at a time. If they're wetland, if their swamp dries out, they create a little slime cocoon and they pretty much just go dormant. It's like hibernation on steroids. And they can wait for years at a time for that water to come back. Once they feel that water come back, there they go again. They wake up and they go out and start hunting. Like, <laughs> insane. Not, not feeding for like two years straight. Yeah. Yeah. So that, and that's what's so cool about science and learning about wildlife is you learn about just all of these insane traits about these animals. We were talking about nature ADD right at the start. I'm looking at all these birds. I looked up uh, the Cornell Bird Lab has an amazing new tool called the BirdCast. Um, they're tracking migratory birds uh, through radar. So actually what we used to see storms and weather patterns, but you can, radar has become so good that um, it's called dual polarization radar, I think. Um, 
they can even see songbirds. So these little warblers uh, on radar. I checked it the past couple of nights because we're getting these cool fronts that come down. So over the past two nights, we have had almost 3 million birds pass through Palm Beach County. So these birds, they migrate at night. During the day, they'll settle down, they'll find some food, they'll take a rest. Uh, and then at night, they get up and they lift up and they migrate in mass. Okay, so that's about twice the population of humans in Palm Beach County. We have about a million and a half people in Palm Beach County. Twice that many birds flew over us the past two nights. <laughs> and a lot of these guys are this big and they're traveling a migration of thousands and thousands of miles and just taking stops and rests in places like Delaware Scrub to well, refuel along the way. These fragments of natural landscape. Yeah, yeah. it's amazing. All right, so Tori, I wanna to talk to Kylie about yeah. uh, food chains and then I wanna to talk to you about management here in the swamp because okay. we're doing some really cool things. Oh, we got some nice backlighting here. Awesome. You All guys, right. we were lucky enough to set some more traps and find some other cool critters. We have another amphiuma in here, but we also have some other things. So this ecosystem here, you know, quite a few different creatures live in here. And um, that's because there is availability of food, let alone just the water being here, as you guys learned, they can somewhat exist, normally stop feeding when there's no water, they have to go into a sort of dormant state. But here you can see a couple of examples of different creatures that this amphiuma might take advantage of and eat part of their food chain here. So as we said, they love to live in the muck here. There's muck has a bunch, a bunch of nutrients, something that we call detritus, which is dead um, organic matter that breaks down and kind of settles to the bottom. So you're going to attract smaller species. So we'll see some, you know, small insects in larval form. So like some baby mosquitoes or baby dragonflies. Those things will get eaten by things like tadpoles. I don't know if you can bring them in here, Sam, and see some of the tadpoles that we have in here or some crayfish. But you know, these tadpoles, um, as they're young, they're gonna eat all that small larval fish. Then we have some crayfish as well in here. They're gonna do the same thing. They're gonna eat these small larval things. They're also gonna help clean up a lot of that detritus. But then the presence of these are gonna bring things like our salamanders, like the greater siren and the two-toe amphiuma in here um, as a great place to hunt for food. A lot of these guys, um, the crayfish in general, they are scavengers, so they're gonna take advantage of anything in this ecosystem that they can. But this is really what's important is, you know, when you see um, certain indicator species um, like tadpoles and like crayfish within these areas, you know that you can start seeing larger predators as the food chain um, builds up so that larger predators can have access to these smaller predators. I want to show this, this amphiuma has given us just such a wonderful view over here. So you can really see that poor eyesight. You can see those two eyes, but if you guys have ever seen like um, a basking shark or a six, seven gill shark um, in ocean documentaries or on TV, during Shark Week, you can see they have those similar eyes. Um, they're those dark clouded eyes, which you can tell you that they really don't rely on those as their main form of um, sense. So they're gonna use more of a sense of touch. So you can see that it can sense when it bumps into things. Right, and so the other thing, Kylie mentioned that these are an indicator species. Um, the amphiuma's presence here. So that's telling us that not only is the habitat productive enough to sustain prey, uh, that can sustain a predator like this, but it's an amphibian. So what is it telling us additionally that, that makes it an indicator species? So amphibians are, um, they are a creature that are super sensitive to water chemistry changes um, and quality changes within wetland environments. So the fact that we're seeing not only amphiumas and we're also seeing tadpoles, which are baby frogs, um, that tells us that this water quality is good. They would not be able to exist here if we had poor water quality. So this tells us um, land managers and researchers and scientists that um, the water that is coming in here is some good quality H2O. All right. All right, so Sam, I'm gonna hand this back to you. All right, Kylie, thank you so much. Yeah. Um, Tori, let's dive into the swamp here. Okay. We wanna end in the, in the swamp just because, you know, what field trip is complete without us going in the mud? Yeah, be careful. Take it easy. Nice and slow. All right, so one of the 
things that I like to talk to folks about when they come out in the swamp is, oh, aren't you scared of alligators? Aren't you scared of snakes? Aren't you scared of all this other stuff? It all comes with education and understanding our environment. All right. So, okay. You got it? Yeah. So right here, understanding our environment, this pathway right here, it looks like a big animal created that. So this would be kind of one of these alert situations for me <laughs> if I was exploring in the swamp, especially alone. Now, I also have a pretty good idea that it wasn't a very big alligator that made this pathway, right? So we're pretty isolated here in this wetland. It is definitely possible that we'll have alligators in here. Pretty much any freshwater in Florida, you've got to assume probably alligators. But we also manage this, this property. So I'm guessing this was actually people who made this pathway? <laughs> it's actually a pathway so that I can access um, our, the area better for planning for exotic removal. Right. And so one of those exotics is right here and it's intermixed with a native. And so we've got this floating vegetation here. So our native is this just tiny little ornate plant right here. This is called mosquito fern, right? Yeah, azola. So azola is the one of our native floating plants. And there's, but, there's actually an exotic one too, but this one is the native. So that, that is really cool. And you've got to really look at like under a hand lens yeah, to see hand the lens. features, yep. right? But the majority of what we see here is this more oval shaped leaf. And this is a genus called Salvinia. Salvinia minima. Yeah. yeah. And so there's two species. There's Salvinia minima and molesta. molesta. And both are exotics and both can really explode, right? Yeah. And so that's what is going on here. 10 years ago, um, we didn't have this uh, plant here, um, but it has come in, uh, it's gotten established. Um, and so Tori, talk to us about the different approaches that you're using to try to manage this because we can't let this cover the whole swamp. Yeah. What it will do is it'll completely knock out sunlight from getting down into the water and feeding these native plants and it'll really kind of kill this ecosystem. Yeah. So what, what are we doing here to try to deal with this? Um, so I actually have like a four pronged approach. So I'm doing, um, I have strung up ropes in um, the Southern part of the wetland and I'm going to string one up in the Northern part and they act as like booms and they kind of hold the salvinia back from going into those other areas. And then I, hand remove the salvinia with nets and other devices um, from those areas that we've uh, cordoned it out of. And then um, I also do um, a little bit of herbicide treatment, very limited because I don't want to impact the frogs on the site that much, um, especially during the reproductive times um, and larval development. And then um, the main the main thing that we're trying to do right now is get this um, weevil established. It's called a salvinia weevil, and it's only it only predates um, plants from the genus salvinia, both of which are exotic. So it's not going to eat any of our native plants. It's only going after salvinia, and it's actually been in Florida waters probably since the 1920s. So it's actually present in probably 70% of Florida's wetlands already, but it had not been um, introduced to this wetland because it's so isolated. So I actually introduced it um, last year. And so that's really cool. And this is what we call bio controls, right? So this is instead of using a chemical, it is taking a predator of this species from its homeland and bringing it here and introducing it into this system so that it can do what it does naturally and knock this population back down because without those natural controls uh this thing can explode and really impact these spaces so we are totally out of time um it was a wonderful morning uh i want to thank tori any any questions before we go yeah one really quick um i know that you guys do cleanups and students um actually have the ability probably with a parent or guardian or the teacher um signing up with them and then they would be able to do restoration as well during cleanups, I know that some people have been involved. I've seen it on the ERM site, and I've been involved in well um, doing uh, planting. So would that be a possibility for people to get involved? 
Absolutely. Yeah. Go to our website, pbcerm.com, pbcerm.com. Uh, there's a tab up on top uh, and it says, uh, I want to, uh, and just go down to sign up for a volunteer event. Uh, Ann Matthews is our volunteer coordinator. She is also a photographer extraordinaire. The vast majority of what you see on our social media, she's hiding, she's camera shy, um, is from Ann, but come volunteer with her. Um, she does amazing work with Tori and the rest of our site managers. Connect with us on social if you haven't. Join us for the rest of the field trips. And I think most importantly, get out and explore your backyard. The weather's finally lightening up and it's getting to be such an important time here with migration coming through and everything to spend some time outside. Um, so thank you guys. Uh, thank you, Tori. Thank you, Bush Wildlife um, and Kylie and the rest of the crew, Sam behind the camera. Um, we'll see you guys next month for another adventure. Uh, we're not sure where that's going to be yet, but we'll get the word out two or three weeks in advance. So we hope you guys can join us. Thank you all. Thanks.